This is the Pixar Sciatica Podcast. Eastern medicine, what is it? What's the difference between Eastern medicine and Western medicine? And I have encountered various different Western medicine practitioners. That's where you're looking at the MDs, DOs, a lot of the folks who are using, say, the more modern uses of medicine, which often include surgery and medications. But Eastern medicine, on the other hand, we're looking at a little bit more of the natural remedies, looking more so specifically about how the energy uh, flows through the body and the imbalances. And I've interviewed multiple guests uh, in the past, but today's guest, um, what I'm really excited about is that we got connected um, probably a couple weeks ago, and I was really intrigued because his background is both in acupuncture and chakra management, which I found to be extremely exciting. And so today I have Dr. Alex Joannou. Um, who is an acupuncturist and also helpful all across the world. So, Dr. Alex, thank you so much for being on today's episode. Uh, thanks, Ashley. Yeah, and tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, well, actually, um, I'm a, I was a fully Western-trained uh, medical doctor. I graduated 45 years ago, a hint at how long I've been doing this job. And it's actually through my own health issues where Western medicine didn't have the answers for me. I had major surgery, lost 10 kilo, uh, tw uh, no, 20 kilo, sorry, in the process uh, from uh, surgery from uh, um, Crohn's disease. The uh, issue there was that um, when I had the operation and the, uh, I asked the surgeon, should I go on any particular diet? And he said, no, nah, eat what you like, you're cured. And I say, you're beauty. Uh, but within six weeks of surgery, I started getting symptoms again. And a friend of mine put me on to a doctor who is involved with mega doses of vitamins and minerals. And I went on to various diets and then I ended up seeing a, um, a naturopath and shiatsu therapist and all sorts of people, kinesiologists, in an effort to uh, be rid of the problem, which eventually I did. So that was uh, now um, nearly 30 years ago and, and it hasn't come back since. Whereas with Western medicine, I had major surgery and the symptoms came back within six weeks. Yeah, it's a really interesting. You brought up the, the aspects of, yeah, what do I eat now that I, I got this surgery? And they said, you're pretty much cured. And this brings up a very interesting talking point that I often see across uh, the health and wellness sphere. But let me know if you agree the the typical education time spent on diet and healthy eating is maybe one or two lectures in, in an actual academic setting yeah. before you actually go out and practice? Well, uh, yeah, to be specific, in my case, I went to Sydney University, which is, I thought, the best university in Australia for medicine. And um, our five-year course, we spent one hour on diets, one hour. I was going to say, and probably um, a total of about three hours on vitamins. Yeah. And do you think... I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons as to why this is the case, but I just know that, especially mm. when going through my education as a physio, there we have to we had to cram so much knowledge within a very short period of time. So, from a logistics standpoint, we 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 just didn't have the time to do it. And I had to pursue a lot of the nutrition, and eating well, and a lot of a lot of the lifestyle habits actually on my own time, yeah. just because I just didn't have the capacity in school. Is that something that you've also observed? Yeah, yeah. Well, even uh, since medical school, I mean, the only education most doctors get is via drug companies, sponsored events. And uh, diets doesn't feature. I mean, even on uh, um, talk about cholesterol issues, I mean, the focus is on the latest wonder drug and how one drug compares with another drug and so on. So that's that's generally the focus, unfortunately. For sure. I totally understand. It is unfortunate. And so here you were are practicing medicine and then were an actual patient in the system and observed mm. the, the limitations. And so you got involved or interested into the Eastern medicine aspect. And that's yeah. I tell us a little bit more about how you got into that. Yeah, well, it was, um, uh, I, it was actually a... Um, the Australian Medical Acupuncture College put on a uh, one-day event in my town, which was, uh, I live uh, 500 kilometres or so from Sydney. So it was 
very uncommon for them to do that. And I went along and I was, they had a, a doctor there interviewing a patient and he was a Western trained medical doctor, but he was also fully Eastern trained uh, uh, TCM practitioner. And he was asking a whole series of questions about the patient's lifestyle that Western doctors just don't ask. And surprisingly, the patient had answers for these questions. And what I realised on reflection afterwards, the, the questions basically focused on, on the autonomic nervous system, how well the digestion is working, the amount of gastric juices that are being produced, amount of saliva, the bowel habits is much much, much greater questioning about bowel habit compared with uh, what a Western doctor will, uh, will ask. And so I realised that um, the, uh, the Chinese, the whole Chinese philosophy of medicine sort of uh, is really focused on how things are functioning or not functioning rather than what disease an organ has. The Western uh, have always uh, focused on, you know, pathogenesis and and pathology looking at tissue that's abnormal and why it became abnormal rather than having a, a liver organ say that under biopsies and all the tests seems to be normal and yet it's not functioning as well as another person's uh, liver so and uh, let alone how those organs are interacting with each other it hasn't really been a focus and even to this day still not a focus on western medicine yeah, which is yeah. why so often a patient will go to a doctor with a variety of symptoms and the doctor will do all these tests and say there's nothing wrong with you and yet the patient knows there jolly well is something wrong with them because they're feeling mm -hmm. fatigued or whatever the issue is. Uh, but from a Western medical viewpoint, there's no answer. Whereas if you look at the person from a Chinese perspective or Eastern perspective, yeah, you get answers as to why they are. This episode is brought to you by the Patient Advocate Program. Are you tired of not having support between your rehab sessions? Introducing the Patient Advocate Program, a more focused on your recovery and more offering you 24-7 access to a doctorate of physical therapy. Stop waiting in line to be seen and stop spending hours doing long exercise programs. Imagine being able to get all of your care delivered straight to your phone. Best of all, it's affordable. We believe everyone deserves top-notch relief without breaking the bank. So why wait? Take control of your health today and visit PT Patient Advocate advocate.com and book your free call with our experts yeah and that can be extremely frustrating for, for you to be suffering and for you to have every single say known western medicine test saying that there's nothing wrong with you it yeah. is being like you then start asking yourself am i going crazy and this mm -hmm. is actually something that i often see in people who are dealing with sciatica which is the majority of these listeners is yeah you know in some cases Yes, the pain that they're feeling can actually be spotted via an MRI, but there's a lot of research out there that actually shows that there's a large number of people who will actually have degenerations, herniated discs, all these other changes in the lumbar spine and be completely pain free. And it then is. you have those other folks who are in so much pain, the pain is so intense, they can't even function. And they take an MRI on their spine and there's no abnormality. And for the most part, oftentimes they're told to just suck it up or that the pain is all. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately the stigma, especially when it comes to saying, okay, there is something happening within your brain mm -hmm. that is actually conditioned to feel pain. There's a huge stigma. And I especially can speak for more so out here in the U S even just trying to understand or bring up the mental aspect of things. There's a huge stigma against it. And so yeah. people are very resistant to that. But I, and, and another thing that I actually really appreciated you bringing up, Dr. Alex is the fact that mm -hmm. being able to ask deep questions. And I know for me, the interactions when I have with my doctors, my interactions are probably five to 10 minutes long. And luckily for me as a healthcare practitioner, I can actually succinctly describe everything that I'm going through because of the fact that I am a healthcare practitioner. But for the mm -hmm. most part, not everyone who is suffering is in healthcare. And so they don't know what they don't know and it is hard to actually vocalize and share what you're dealing with in a short five minute segment so i do appreciate you saying mm. the, the importance of asking this question so let's get into the meat and potatoes about all this right so one of the big yeah. things oh. that that people are dealing with and the reason why people are on this podcast is this concept of pain but specifically sciatica pain so we're looking at pain yeah. originating either from the back or from the hips um 
but before we like take a deep dive into that, I think it is important for people to just understand just like two big definitions or a little bit of an understanding because one of the things that I was so intrigued about you was the fact that you knew about acupuncture, but you also knew about chakra balancing too. And mm -hmm. so they're both part of Eastern medicine, but they're originating from a couple different parts of yes. Asia, right? So can you share with us a little bit more about chakras and acupuncture and the difference? Yeah, yeah it's interesting because uh, the two systems, the, the Chinese acupuncture system and the Hindu uh, Ayurvedic system of uh, the chakras developed in parallel over the last two or three thousand years and yet there was no real <clears throat> communication between the two and um, it wasn't until 1997 which is very recent times that a book was written about <clears throat> the chakras are, are really acupuncture points I mean if you think about it uh, an acupuncture point is a focus of energy along a along a channel or meridian as they're commonly called and in chakras they usually see uh, well the main concept is seven major chakras or energy centers from the top of the head to the uh, tip of the spine at uh, the tail and uh, but those points correspond to actual points on the acupuncture system and therefore uh, is open to manipulation by acupuncture needling and uh, I guess that was uh, really born to mind because I'd already be, I've been doing acupuncture for 25 years and around about um, 15 years ago I came across this system concept of the chakras and uh, being really acupuncture points or it, it, by another name and then I developed uh, learned this system or created a system, I suppose, really, of using acupuncture to help the chakras in a consistent Western-based system. Initially, when I uh, came across this system, it was the focus was on people's mental health uh, in terms of people who meditated a lot, who wanted to raise their consciousness. And that's fine, and I learned that. And I, when I went back to my practice, I thought, well, most of the people I see aren't in that position of just being in it for meditation. They come to me because they're sick. They got very symptoms. So I just applied the same principles, but to patient with physical problems. And, and it was when I had uh, one person particularly who was um, into meditation and wanted this system to raise uh, her level of consciousness. And I said, okay, let's do it. And that her back pain resolved and each time she says like what are you doing different this time than when i'd previously done acupuncture on her and the effect was uh, a lot more powerful and it was a lot more lasting and that sort of opened up this the concepts that uh, of mind body and spirit that the person's state of mind and their state of spirituality can affect uh, their physical health and vice versa so and in particular, like with sciatica, often I find a lot of these people have um, uh, blocked uh, root chakras. Uh, the root chakra is the uh, ch lowest chakra at the base of the spine and is to do with feeling grounded and connected to life, uh, a sense of belonging, uh, which can be tribal or belonging to uh, you know, a group or society. And, and when you uh, work on it, them the not only back pain improves but their whole attitude to life and that starts changing they feel more secure uh, safer they notice physically they notice stronger energy in the legs like when they go walking and so on they can feel the power in their legs and uh, less uh, troubled by back pain so it was happening consistently enough that i thought oh, i've got to really <laughs> investigate this and I found then that, um, you know, all the chakras uh, can be affected. Uh, and I developed a questionnaire based on questions relating to people's physical symptoms, like where in the body they're feeling symptoms and their state of mind, uh, whether they're feeling depressed or anxious and so forth, or whether they're feeling happy and joyful. And also their state of spirituality, whether they're feeling connected to the divine or whether they feel lost and so on and so forth. And uh, 
and putting it all together, it compiled this sort of system really of being able to delineate it where in the body the issues lie, particularly with which chakras and therefore which needle points need to be needled to help. And um, it's created a, a system where, where people can come in with back pain and find not only the back pain goes away, but they don't feel depressed anymore. And which, as you would know, uh, depression and, and chronic pain is a big issue. Um, so it, it, it can go both ways because uh, chronic pain can cause depression. And if you're depressed and you get some painful condition, it's more likely to become chronic. So it's uh, sort of a negative, uh, negative cycle there. So, yeah, I, you know, I guess thinking about it, the most significant time had a patient who was diagnosed by an orthopedic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, as requiring surgery for sciatica. So I thought, okay, well, this is genuine sciatica. And the patient came to see me because he was desperate to avoid surgery. And he was booked in for surgery about eight to 10 weeks after seeing me. And I examined and, and I agreed he had a genuine sciatica with, you know, straight leg raising was only a, a few uh, few inches off the bed and so on. And uh, so I treated him with this method. And by the end of the eight weeks, he was better and he uh, cancelled the surgery. And I thought, well, that's phenomenal. I mean, that alone has saved the system thousands of dollars. It saved the patient painful operation and maybe totally unnecessary operation or seemed to be unnecessary. So, you know, reproducing that a number of times, it just gets me in more and more enthusiastic about acupuncture <laughs> because, uh, you know, when I started with acupuncture, I started uh, on the patients who were like at the end of the road. They tried everything, Western medical drugs and so on, or surgery and and didn't respond. And I said, well, you've got nothing to lose. Let's try some acupuncture. But uh, they kept telling their friends about how great it was. <laughs> and uh, I get getting more and more people. And so then I started after about a year or so of doing acupuncture saying, well, you've got this problem. Uh, we can go down the Western medical route or we can try acupuncture, which would you like to do? And a fair percentage of people would try acupuncture. But then in the last few years, uh, my focus has changed. So if somebody comes in with a problem, I'll say, let's try acupuncture first. And then if you're not improving within the next month, then we'll do the tests and so on, and then go down the Western medical approach. So, you know, it's sort of done a, th uh, a 180 turn on this concept for me, which was quite big because, as I say, I was totally Western medical trained as a doctor many years ago. Yeah, I think it's, I'm, I'm glad that you shared that because I know that, especially in my training, when we were going through school, they were saying, Ashley, as a physical therapist, you're the movement expert. And so I remember graduating from school saying that I was the only stop for any sort of movement related dysfunctions. And it actually yeah. caused a whole bunch of limitations to my practice because it then resulted in me putting up blinders and saying, I'm going to be the only person. If I can't fix this person, no one can. Yeah. And that is a very uh, selfish and short, short, short sighted way to look at your profession yeah. and how you can help people. And it was one of the great things, one of the really big, amazing benefits of, of running a podcast like this, where we can actually interview other professionals such as yourself, because now, especially over the, well, I've been practicing for 12 years, we'll say over the past 10 years, I've recognized that there isn't, there are many different ways for us to treat a problem. And it's not like Western medicine is the only thing to go to. It's not like mm. medicine is that there's a place for, um, for both. And I really yeah. appreciate that that um, that look. And for listeners, I remember when I was a little wary of Eastern medicine, especially from the energy points. Um, I actually had the opportunity to take a look at a lot of the energy points. Now I'm not very mm -hmm. well versed at finding them, but one of the biggest things that I've noticed, and you probably noticed too, Dr. Alex, is that a lot of these energy points are actually running in line with a lot of the peripheral nerves the moment that yeah, they get the line. And while Eastern medicine describes uh, the flow along those points as chi and energy, Western mm. medicine describes them as electrical chemical processes, right? So neurosynaptic yeah. changes yeah. in chemical processes yeah. and electrical signals. And so 
once I was able to actually apply, just like you said, I had a huge understanding and greater appreciation for it. And it actually was really interesting because I look at um, acupressure points, for example, and it's like, well, mm-hmm. why are you pressing at one part of your foot? And that's going to stimulate digestion. But it's really yeah. interesting is because if you look at the dermatomal chart of the foot, you're looking at the like various different spinal levels that also influence that specific area or that specific organ. So that was actually something that I found to be extremely intriguing. So, um, and thank you so much for sharing. Like, it's, it's great to hear that, you know, you transition from all right, Western to Eastern and now it's like Eastern and then to Western. So having that fluidity mm-hmm. between, between concentrations, let's talk about sciatic itself. So um, I think what a lot of, oftentimes I get presented and I met with other doctors too. They're like, actually like your treatment method, it's kind of like in a black box. Like, I don't really know what you're doing in there. And so oftentimes when I'm describing to other practitioners or other people trying to figure out, well, what's my method of treatment? I boil my method of treatment down into a very simple three-step process. Number one, we focus on the activities that actually reduce your pain. And that could be anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a super structured thing. Like if someone bends over and touches their toes and their pain goes away, like, okay, that's a really good clue in regards to that's the type of exercise we should be implementing. The second part is going to be eliminating or modifying those activities that actually increase someone's pain. And so that's where we get the opportunity to look a little bit more and to say like the lifestyle and be able to say like, what behaviors are you doing throughout the day to be contributing to your pain? And then step number three for me is going to be, okay, now, now we have steps one and two done. Now it's time to create an actual plan for you to get back into living your life pain free. So when a patient comes in, and says, Dr. Alex, I've been, you know, I've been going through the entire gamut of the orthopedic process, but I've heard some really great things. What are a couple of things or tell us uh, like what a typical assessment would be in regards to that? What are you looking for? I know that you briefly talked about the straight leg raise and also looking at the root. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that process. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I guess, the most important thing is that most people who are told they've got sciatica, they don't actually have sciatica. Um, um, I mean, you would be aware of piriformis syndrome, uh, which is a piriformis little muscle sitting over the back of the hip going quite deep under the gluteus muscles. And uh, that can be in spasm. And the thing is, when it goes into spasm, it's, it's pressing on the sciatic nerve. So the symptoms can be exactly that of sciatica. And yet, if you stick an acupuncture needle in that muscle and relaxes the muscle, the uh, sciatica goes away. And that's quite different from a nerve root uh, being pressed on uh, because of a prolapsed disc, as you would be aware. Yet uh, if patients go and get MRIs, for example, and it shows a knobbly arthritic-looking spine with some bit of uh, softening of the discs and prolapsing and so on, well, it always seems to be a natural assumption that that must be causing the pain. And yet quite often, as you said, it's not. You can have an abnormal spine and yet have no pain. So the pain doesn't necessarily come from that. So I guess I rely more on the physical examination of the patient and the history and um, and then try the acupuncture. If they're not responding, then I'll say get x-rays or MRI. I mean, most patients have already had multiple x-rays and MRIs when they come in to see me in any case. But, um, yeah, they, they often, the imaging isn't, always the most helpful i guess uh, one of the biggest clues with sciatica is uh, um well not being true sciatica uh, which is where nerve roots are pressing on the spine is that uh you quiz the patient carefully and the pain's radiating down the leg but it's more going down the sides of the leg uh, particularly the sides of the thighs rather than at the back of the thighs and that's a very very common picture and yet these patients are being diagnosed as having sciatica. But uh, usually when you assess them, they, you can find various tender points which are, relate to acupuncture points on the backside that um, usually refer to uh, mostly uh, what are called gallbladder points in Chinese medicine. So if, if I discover that when they're complaining of back pain, when I physically examine them, I think, woohoo, because I'm pretty confident that I can help them very quickly with acupuncture if you feel those points in their tender. Because normally uh, with true sciatica, uh, those points aren't tender. 
Yeah, and I'll tell you, I really appreciate you saying based on the physical exam because what's yeah. really interesting is I'm, I'm right there with you. So listeners, remember sciatic, sciatica itself is going to be a description that the sciatic nerve is irritated, but you have to yeah. understand that the sciatic nerve originates from the back and then passes down through, uh, through or under your piriformis and it goes down the backside of your leg. So what mm. that actually does is the fact that it applies sensation to your hamstring, the back of your thigh, your calf, your shin and your foot and so what that means is if you are having pain or neural or changes or symptoms either on the outer aspects of your thighs which the outer aspects of your thighs we call it the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve it's a different nerve but it can come from the same portion of the back but that also in, in means that we need to look at another piece of the puzzle and i and i'm glad that you brought up pure form mm. because it helps us understand okay is the pain that we're feeling or the pain that you're feeling is it truly coming from your back is it truly is it coming from a dysfunctional piriformis could it be from those gallbladder points and yeah. what is really important throughout your journey when you're working with someone like dr alex or someone like myself anybody is that mm -hmm. you have you have to work with the practitioner because as you're telling this information your experiences you are painting a picture for the practitioner and there's no detail is too minute because it allows us to do our jobs a little bit better, a lot better, right? Yeah, so yeah. Okay, source of pain. So I really appreciate you sharing that. With yeah, me. yeah. Because I, you know, I think it's unfortunate that as time has gone on, the the emphasis on Western medical approach is less on history taking and examination and more on the tests. I mean, the, the MRI, as you would know, is quite amazing the detail you can see, but it doesn't give you all the answers. And it doesn't uh, replace a physical examination and a good history taking. It takes longer to do that, unfortunately. And most doctors are limited with their time. Very limited. And unfortunately, there's a lot more people who are in pain than the folks who can actually provide that relief. And so we end up getting extremely squeezed. And so I, I, I'm not surprised that uh, you can't uh, address this all in in one visit or or even the, within a 15 minute encounter because you have all these tests. And I really, really appreciate the test because it actually helps us roll out a whole bunch of different things. Right? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I appreciate you saying like, it is important to have those tests because um, you'll see on social media, people will be like, Oh, you never need this test. And it ends up being extremely polarizing. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we have two specific points. We have one, like a group of folks who are saying like imaging doesn't matter at all. And then the other side is like, we got to, we got to do every single image, every single test. And so I think it is important to be within the middle and recognize the benefits of two. So, um, so with that being the case, right? So with acupuncture, I think um, what's really interesting uh, when it comes to say doing any sort of modality, it's important for us to talk a little bit about expectations because I've had a couple of patients, people come to me and they'll, they'll say, I've tried acupuncture once or twice and it didn't do anything. And I think it is important for the listeners to understand, well, what are we looking at from an experience standpoint, length yeah. of time standpoint, and how can we tell if treatment's working? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, usually anybody who sees me for any, any reason, I say, you really got to give this a good eight weeks at coming once a week. Um, and, you'll, and I give them various questionnaires, uh, pain inventory questionnaires, which may, uh, people rate their levels of pain through various ways and then compare it over time uh, you know sometimes you can get lucky and the first treatment or two the person gets up and go wow that was amazing <laughs> and uh, they can feel an immediate response but other times it's slower and and that's understandable and it's sort of uh, people who give up after one treatment it's like going to the gym once and coming away saying well look i haven't got any muscles i'm not going to go back again and do all that <laughs> you know it takes time <laughs> and and you know i guess we live in a society where you can take a painkiller and within you know half an hour the pain is gone so but that's but that's really masking the problem it doesn't really fix the problem but it gives people a false sense of how quickly things should uh, heal. I mean, you know, whether you break an arm or a leg or whether you've got a, a really uh, bad uh, soft tissue injury, you know it's going to take some period of weeks to get better, regardless of what you're doing. 
So it does uh, require time. And the other thing patients should note with acupuncture is sometimes the fir first, usually it happens in the first treatment or two if it's going to happen, is that it can stir up symptoms, which that can be quite depressing for the person on the receiving end, but it's very helpful for the acupuncturist because it's telling them something about what's happening in the body uh, and how the body's reacting to what you're doing with the acupuncture. So that informs the acupuncturist for their next treatment, what they're going to do in that treatment, whether they're going to modify the treatment or so on. So it's a sort of, uh, you know, uh, to a degree, it's put the needle in and see what happens type idea. And so, but, you know, in stirring it up, uh, patients think, well, it's made it worse and then can be scared off acupuncture. But uh, really the worst situation with acupuncture is you give uh, someone a series of treatments and there's no change whatsoever. As long as they can feel some sort of change, and sometimes with acupuncture, the change might only be for an hour or two or three or half a day after the treatment, they'll feel better. Uh, but it comes back. And it's because I, I, I try to explain it in terms of their body has a certain way of working, which isn't good for them, but that's their habits. And what we're trying to do with the acupuncture is change the flow of energy, change the way you're using your body. And, and sometimes that will hold just for a few hours, sometimes for a day or two. But with repeated treatments, uh, when you're on the right track with repeated treatments, um, the person gets uh, improvement lasts longer and it's a stronger improvement till you've gotten rid of the problem. One thing I know, <laughs> now that makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, I think that the most success the most successful interactions that I've had with clients is when I set some clear expectations in regards to what what to look forward over the next, say, six to eight weeks. Yeah. It turns out you're actually going to have an increase in pain. There are going to be some of the things that we do which might increase it, but some of the things that we do might actually decrease it. And so understand, like helping clients understand that when we're working together, we're going through a specific process. And I think one of the mm. challenges, especially out here in the States, is that there are a lot of people who are just saying, oh, you have sciatica pain. Here, here are these 13 different exercises that you need to do, and you just need to keep doing that. And I think what ends up happening with that type of scenario is that they look at that exercise as really more of like a one and done type of scenario, where mm. truth be told, when you're trying to treat the whole person, you have to understand that you are, in fact, treating a dynamic human being and what that yeah. means is that there are many different factors that we need to take into account the causes of sciatica pain or sciatica like pain are different amongst people person versus person based on their lifestyle and based on their anatomy so being able to set up the expectation saying hey we're going to spend the next six eight weeks figuring this out i really appreciate you saying dr alex saying that you would put the needle in and see what happens because unfortunately when it comes to pain management nothing is actually ever definitive or set in stone Mm. And the reality is that every piece of information that we get from you, the listener, you, the patient, is something that's actually going to help you, us formulate yeah. our hypothesis, our educated guess. And every single yeah. intervention is going to allow us to refine and either support our hypothesis, saying that this was in fact the case, or if it doesn't work out as planned, it actually allows us to change direction. And so yeah. it is important to that. Um, one thing that you did bring up, Dr. Alex, and you said, um, you know, put a needle in, see what happens and a change. And so for the folks who need a little bit more time, it can get frustrating to mm -hmm. see the lack of change or maybe not even necessarily understand what change truly means. I know that when I'm working yeah. with the clients that I'm working with, so say, for example, someone's been in pain for, you know, three to five years and they say, Ashley, it hurts when I sit. Well, one mm. of the first questions, or first couple of questions, what I would say, well, I got to see how you sit. That's number one. But then also number two, how long can you tolerate sitting? Because that actually gives me some sort of measurable progress. And even if it's like mm. five minutes and after that session, they can sit for a whole six minutes, you know, that's yeah. a 20 percent increase. So what my job was, what I would end up doing is asking these questions to be able to say, hey, this is how we're going to define change. So I would love to hear a little bit more about your your take on recording those changes over time. 
Yeah, it, it is. Um, the, the brief pain inventory is a simple method uh, uh, to see exactly where a person's at because um, you're asking them to rate their severity of pain out of 10, which most people, even though you can't compare some one person's 5 out of 10 with another person's 5 out of 10, they've shown that consistently a person will rate the pain level accurately. You're measuring it, um, what they're like on their worst day, what they're like on their best day and what their average level of pain is, but also how it's in affecting their sleep, um, their daily activities, how much it's interfering with work, uh, how much it's interfering with the relationships because, you know, a person who's in chronic pain is often quite irritable and can't handle an emotional situation with somebody else and they fly off the handle. So having that, I, I try to score everybody that comes in on their first visit with this method. And then even within three or four weeks, often they'll say, well, the pain's still there. But when you do the scoring, you'll find actually they're sleeping a lot better. Uh, they're not as irritable. Their, uh, their relationships are, have improved and their, you know, their worst days are not as bad as they were before and so on. So um, when they reflect on it, they go, oh, yeah, I guess it has improved. And so uh, because people tend to, uh, uh, I guess, focus on the negative side of things sometimes in these situations. Which gets me thinking, Dr. Alex, when a patient comes to you and they're saying, Dr. Alex, I'm not making any sort of improvement, what do you usually yeah. say to them? When that, when that well, happens. I mean, it depends if I think uh, that I'm on the right track or not with what's going on with them. I mean, if they've, they've had sufficient number of treatments, uh, you know, I don't say, well, let's keep going indefinitely. I, I then, you know, say, okay, it's time to do some tests and find out what's going on here and uh, try to sort it out from a Western medical approach and, if necessary, get, you know, a, a Western specialist's uh, opinion on these things. Yeah, so, that makes yeah. sense. But I always say, well, let's try the acupuncture first before yeah. going to that. Uh, you know, in the old days, um, as in <laughs> in my younger days, uh, patients would come in, say, with bad back pain, and they say, I want to see a specialist. And you go, okay, send off to the specialist. But what you discover is that I say now to patients, look, if I send you to this orthopedic surgeon or this neurosurgeon, you understand that they are surgeons. So they're looking to operate on you. How does that sit with you? And quite often the patients are horrified and go, no, I don't want an operation. But because it's the person is registered as a specialist, they think therefore the, uh, they must be somehow better at diagnosing or have some magic wand that the regular doctor doesn't have. And it's not the case. It, you know, uh, to a, a surgeon, everything, you know, it's like a, if you've got a big hammer, everything needs <laughs> needs to be struck with the hammer. Uh, and so uh, it, with a surgeon, everything, they're, they're immediately thinking in, what can I operate on that's going to fix what procedure will fix this problem? And a lot of the time there's no procedure. And the, the honest uh, a surgeon will say, I can't help you with this. You need to see, you know, physiotherapist or acupuncturist or whoever. But uh, a lot of times the patient's so insistent that the surgeons will operate. And, um, I mean, I was horrified to find that, um, you know, I had one patient who had seen three orthopedic surgeons. This was in the old days before neurosurgeons became involved. And, um, and they all said, you know, the operation won't fix your problem. But the, certain patients have it so fixed in their mind, they keep going until they find a surgeon who will say, yes, I'll operate. And the thing is, then they get shocked when the operation doesn't fix their problem. And um, it's very disappointing for them. So I'm much more proactive at that nowadays at saying, look, this person is a surgeon. They'll want to operate. If that's not in your range of thinking, don't even bother going down that way. Yeah. Yeah, that makes full sense. Like, especially, I'm really appreciative of you saying, you know, if they've reached the point of where you have done everything that you can to help them that referring out. I think that one of the challenges with professionals is that they don't like to admit that they don't mm. know what this problem is. And so it makes it very, very 
uh, resistant to actually referring out. So I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. Um, I know that for me, whenever I'm interacting with a client and they're saying, actually, I'm not making any sort of changes. One of the big things that I like to ask is, okay, well, tell me a little bit more about that. And I, you, very similar to like the inventory that you use, I bring up the various different measures that we've taken and then we kind of go through it together to just get a better understanding to be able to say, is there truly no change? Or are there mm -hmm. smaller degrees of change that often get overshadowed? And the same deal yeah. that if there's no change and I don't know what's going on, then referring out is actually very, very important. And so, yeah. Dr. Alex, as we as as we come to the close of this episode, tell us a little bit more because we always want to make sure that the listeners leave with some sort of action, right? As an acupuncturist and with your and and with your experience in Eastern medicine as well. Let's talk about some action steps that the listeners can take when they're dealing with sciatica and they're like, I want to take a look into the Eastern medicine standpoint. What are some things that they can do on their own? And then number two, if they are looking for, or if they are in the active search for an acupuncturist, what are some qualities or things that they should be looking for to ensure that they're going to be getting the quality? Yeah, yeah sure. fair enough. Um, yeah, well, it's simple action steps. Uh, the worst thing I think people do is, uh, like what I'm doing now, is sitting down. I mean, we, we all have, uh, not all, but a huge percentage of us now have very sedentary type jobs, which involves a lot of sitting. So, uh, and sitting can be, uh, you know, really bad for you <laughs> if you're not sitting right. So, um, keeping, uh, getting up and moving about is often uh, really helpful, you know, Often people will find just gentle movement, um, whether it's just going for a stroll, is is helpful. So keeping on moving rather than uh, uh, giving up and lying in bed all day long. I mean, obviously there's certain situations where, yeah, you know, just lying in bed is an effort. I mean, that's uh, serious problems. But most times people can get up and do things and move about. Um, Doing yoga stretches, as long as you don't try to push these things to the limit, you're not trying to get a 10 out of 10 <laughs> pain pain level. You're just going through gentle range of motion. These things are all uh, helpful in terms of getting the body moving because the, the body, is, as you said before, is very dynamic and and it's designed to be moving all the time. It's designed to, the muscles are designed to work and so forth. And if you're just sitting or just lying all day, that's that's not good at all. Even the circulation, like in the legs, will slow down and so on. So that's very helpful. I mean, in terms of acupuncturists, um, you know, there's a lot of people who do what's called dry needling, which superficially looks like acupuncture because the person is sticking a needle in various parts of the body. But... Um, an acupuncturist has uh, learned things to a much deeper level, much, much deeper level than um, than a dry needler. So if a person, well, especially in the US, a, a person would be a licensed acupuncturist. So if, they, if they're labelled licensed acupuncturist, that means they've re reached a certain standard for sure. So I've been looking at that. And, um, I mean, I've, I've been training... A lot of acupuncturists in the method that I've called transformational acupuncture, um, mostly from the mental health aspects. So I have a website called stickittodepression.com, which, as you know, chronic back pain, a lot of people are depressed. So stickittodepression.com. And on there, there's a list of certified practitioners that I've trained in my method, looking at the chakras and what's going on there with their mind, body and spirit aspects to their to their back problem so it, they'll be able to help hopefully even more than the irregular acupuncturist absolutely i appreciate dr alex for you sharing this information with us it's really eye-opening and it's always really exciting to be able to communicate and share some very like-minded views and also being able to see the application of western medicine principles and eastern medicine principles together um listeners if you didn't get a chance to write it down, I'm going to put that link into the show notes. Um, is the, uh, And say, for example, should any of the listeners want to get in touch with you directly, what's the best way? Yeah, yeah. Well, if they go to my website, stickittodepression.com, they can contact me there uh, mm -hmm. by email. Yeah, no problem. Fantastic. 
Dr. Alex, thank you so much for today. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you got some help from today's podcast. And for more info, check us out at ifixyoursciatica.com. Have a fantastic and pain-free day. No patient-therapist relationship is formed by listening to this podcast. We are not providing medical advice and all information should be confirmed by a medical provider.